Hi, this is Amanda. And this is Lindsay. We're True Creeps. Where the stories are true. And the creeps are real. We'll cover stories from grotesque gore. To the possibly plausible paranormal. To horrifying history. To tense and terrible true crime. And everything else that goes bump in the night. We want you to join us while we creep. We cover mature topics. Listener discretion is advised. Hey everyone, welcome to our second Ouija episode. In our first episode on Ouija, we talked about the possible scientific theories for how Ouija boards work, the history of the talking board, and the history of Ouija specifically. You don't need to necessarily listen to the last episode to enjoy this one, but I think you you could benefit from it. You can learn something. So there's a lot of Ouija stories that got pretty popular. One being in the early 1900s, a housewife named Pearl Curran used a Ouija board and she was believed to be communicating with a spirit named Patience Worth. Patience dictated around 5,000 poems, a play, several works, and even a novel. Pearl eventually began using automatic writing rather than Ouija because it was much quicker. Can you freaking imagine a whole novel? My gosh. Okay. Heck yes. That would have, I mean, even just these 5,000 poems, like even if they were one word poems, that's a lot of words to sit and wait for a Ouija board to spell out. What's a one word poem? There's not one. <laughs> I'm saying it's more like even if it was just one word, it would be too much via a Ouija board. Uh, yeah, that that's insane. That's She just lived in her living room with her Ouija board for like nine years to get the- <laughs> Like, could you imagine just, like, the pure gall of that ghost to be like, I'm such a prolific writer that even in death, I'm going to take Pearl's life and make it about me so I can keep writing. Selfish patience. (laughs) Well, when she changed to automatic writing, I I should probably explain that. So mediums would channel the spirit, allowing the guide to be the means of transcribing. So it's different from possession because they're volunteering for them to like take over and write for them and if you're uh if you watch supernatural that's the difference between being possessed by an angel and being possessed by a demon amanda's looking at me like i have three heads but some folks are going to get that reference they're it's going to sink in they're going to be happy about it they will they will so i guess this gives a new understanding of what a ghost writer could be (laughs) (laughs) it's just funny enough i love it love it okay so dumb so weird (laughs) just so weird i just i can't get over how much time it probably took her i'm exhausted just thinking of that that's a lot of that's a lot of words it's a lot of time especially one letter at a time i'm glad she got into automatic writing because yeah smart smart woman yeah all right, so there's other novels also written from a Ouija board, one being Jap Heron. It was published in 1917, and it was also, here's, here's a fun fact, it was written by the ghost of Mark Twain through Emily Grant Hutchings. At least she picked somebody more well-known, or known at all. <laughs> so Hutchings was a friend of Pearl Curran, so our ghostwriter friend. That's not suspicious at all. No, not at all. So this was published seven years after Mark Twain died, and it took her two years to transcribe. So again, that's how long they were sitting there with their Ouija boards, writing their books. Another medium, Lola Hayes, helped, and Mark Twain's daughter, Clara Clemens, sued Hutchings. I also want to know, was there something that he had written that he stored away somehow, and she got her hands on it? Oh God, do you think she would have spent two years to transcribe it if that was the case? Well, that could have just been her ruse. Oh, yeah. I mean, fair. Fair. (laughs) Who could know? Only Lola and her. (laughs) We should ask a Ouija board. (laughs) Oh, God. Let me know how that goes. There's an online one that I saw, and I was like, ah, you tricked me. You're in my house. And I panicked and closed it. (laughs) And then you sent it to me. Yeah. (laughs) As I do. So (laughs) there's this poem, and it's 560 pages. It's called The Changing Light at Sandover. And it took over 20 years to, to write. And it was made up of phrases taken from the Ouija board during seances that James Merrill was hosting. It was actually published in 1982, and it won the National Book Critics Circle Award. That's fascinating. I also wonder if Ouija hadn't recently like just taken off because of The Exorcist, if I'm thinking timing right, 
if it would have had the same appeal, you know, like if it had been during mm-hmm. a time when there was a little bit of a lull in the maybe attraction of the Ouija board. So when I was researching just things that the Ouija board has done over the years, there's a lot of different like myths and rumors where other people were using them to name themselves or to create different documents that aren't necessarily published. Like this is for sure where it came from. But one being Alice Cooper, there's a big rumor that that's where he got his name is a Ouija board. Don't know if that's true. And then also Ooh. the some of the creators that made Alcoholics Anonymous, like their step program, there's some rumors that one of them might have been working with a Ouija board at one time. Huh. That wouldn't be altogether surprising, though, because it seems like in the 20th century, a lot of people were messing around with a Ouija board. I'm also assuming that Alcohol Anonymous was founded in the 20th century. Sure. We're going to go with it. So another section that we're going to talk about, we have four different cases, and there are cases where there's just there's a Ouija board wrinkle. I went onto Google Scholar, and I typed in Ouija board, and I opened every case I could find. And these were the cases that I thought were particularly interesting. There's so many cases where they're like, the court does not have a Ouija board or a crystal ball. And I was like, okay, <laughs> I get it. This is great rhetoric. Like, let's move on. I have to get through these. But so here are a few of the ones that we found. So the City National Bank and Trust Company of Danbury, the executor for the estate of Helen D. Peck, which was an appeal from probate. And it was decided by the Supreme Court of Connecticut on July 30th of 1958. So Helen Peck attended the University of Kansas and the Boston Conservatory for Music, and she married her husband, Frank, in the latter part of the 1890s. I thought it was interesting that she was very educated because that kind of plays into how she's seen later on. So in 1919, the Pecks bought a Ouija board and they would use it together. And then during the 1920s, Helen had a nervous breakdown and was institutionalized. Also during the 1920s, Helena lived apart from her husband, Frank, on the West Coast. She then moved back with her husband in Scarsdale, New York, and the couple moved to Bronxville. Her husband died there in 1935. So five years later, Helen moves to Connecticut, and she built a house in Bethel. In the 1940s, Helen told a friend that she was playing with the Ouija board, and she had made a friend named John Gale Forbes. This is before chat rooms existed? Yeah, this was like for sure before chat rooms existed. Or CB radios, which were like, I feel like another kind of like precursor to AOL chat rooms. But so John Gale Forbes, she meets him through the Ouija board. Now, she spoke with him frequently and she really thought he existed, but she never met him. And so in 1941, when she was 71, she executes her will. For everybody who witnessed her will's creation and her executing it, she seemed like she was of sound mind and capable of handling her own business affairs. And even in the case, I saw a little interesting note that she like still had her artistic and musical opinions and was like very, it seemed like her mind was fully intact. Like she was very lucid. She was great. Yeah. She wasn't considered like a senile old lady who was like wandering around a wreck. Like she looked like she was like fine. And so she was just talking to her friend on the board. Just talking to good old John. So she dies in September of 1955. In her will, she had two household employees who had worked for her for years. She leaves them $1,000 each. She has a portion of money to pay her debts. And then she leaves the remainder of her estate, roughly $178,000. This is 1955 money, by the way. Mm. Right, right. To John Gale Forbes, who she's never met. Now, in the event that Forbes died before Peck, Peck instructed her executors to reinvest the remainder of her estate and the income that comes from the investments should be used for the John Gale Forbes Memorial Fund. And the purpose of that fund was to provide funding for the investigation of, quote, telepathy among the insane for their understanding and cure, end quote. Like a moment, like just like a moment to like let that sink in for a man she's never met. This isn't like a memorial fund for her husband. Yeah. This is John Gale Forbes. So among Helen's papers were references of John and that discussed their conversations as well as the fact that John had physically manifested to her at one point. Whoa. Yeah. Which I thought it was interesting that she thought he was a living person if he had physically manifested as like a ghost. But she said that John was, quote, taking her through the valley of death by the ham, of his restoring her life, helping her to breathe, watching her diet, and taking charge of her day and night. I read that and I was like, what? Was he like her life coach? Okay. That's what it feels like. So after Helen's death, the probate court appointed the city national bank as the executor, I'm assuming it was employers, employees there. And so this lovely employee is tasked 
with finding John Gale Forbes. Oh, no. So despite their efforts, surprise, surprise, they can't find him. And among Helen's papers, there were, like, I think it was journal entries. It showed that she had searched for him for years and couldn't find him either. But she kept him in her will. So the lower court threw out the entire will because they were like, no. Like, she clearly was not of a right mind when she made this. And when it was appealed, yeah. the argument was that being delusional isn't a reason to throw out a will. It's only And the Supreme Court of Connecticut, however, they affirm the lower court's decision, deciding that, like, it's one thing if you're delusional, but if you're delusional and that's what makes you, like, and that's in your will, that will invalidate your will, at least during that time in Connecticut. But interesting, the whole will was thrown out. Yeah. And, you know, if she, if she believed him to be, you know, a real person, right, and they're talking all the time through their Ouija board, mm -hmm. and he's even, like, shown himself to her and she believes he's alive, why didn't she ask him for his number? Maybe she was shy. It's too forward, Amanda. It's too forward. Not becoming of a lady. If only she would have had a lady Ouija board. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, I think that it's an interesting kind of vibe. Especially, I mean, I think people get a little bit caught up in the excitement of talking to someone. And they don't always think to ask all of the questions that us as a spectator to the story later on are like, ask him identifying features. <laughs> I'm shaking my arms around. Right? Well, that, that totally makes sense. Yeah. Well, it's like what people do in, you know, when they watch a movie and they're like, why are you doing that? Yeah. It totally makes sense. And I feel like this friend on the Ouija board is what people do today on, you know, social media. And they find these people that you're really not looking at. Like, you don't know who you're speaking to. It's a really 90 day fiance, but through a Ouija board. She got catfished. Yes, that's exactly. Thank you. That's perfect. She did. By maybe a ghost? Who could know? Cat ghosted. Is that a thing? Yeah, she got ghosted. I think that's also an MTV show. Are you going to patent that now? <laughs> <laughs> Probably. Ouija boards were also found in many additional court cases. For instance, the People versus Jose Luis Torres. And he attempted to rape his niece. He said that the evil spirits from his Ouija board had stuck to him. And that he knew he was going to jail because the Ouija board told him he was. Not that he did something bad. Yeah. And a fool. Yeah. But the Ouija board told him, yeah. It appeared in court again. So on July 29th of 1997, Juan Maldonado had an argument with his girlfriend, Marisol Santiago. Santiago and Maldonado shared an apartment in Hartford, Connecticut. Maldonado was accusing Santiago of having an affair with another man who was named Armando Rivero. Rivero owned a store and it was on the first floor of their apartment building. Maldonado told Santiago that the Ouija board told him that he should go and kill Rivero. <laughs> Oof. Maldonado then attacked Santiago. He punched her in the face and threatened her with a knife. Santiago, gripping the knife, tried to defend herself, and it actually cut her severely. Maldonado then left the apartment and got a sawed-off shotgun that he had hid in a building nearby. Maldonado then went into Rivero's store with the gun, and... Rivero, obviously, he attempted to run away, but Maldonado chased him and shot Rivero once and then twice in the head. Then he was convicted and sentenced to 55 years in prison, all because, supposedly, the Ouija board told him that he needed to kill him. Woof. Which, if someone's cheating on you, like, yeah, you're going to have these very angry feelings. And I think what happened is just, again, he wanted to do something terrible and, like, the Ouija board just gave him that, that push to do the horrible thing. Yeah, I think it sounded like an excuse to me. Exactly. Mm -hmm. well, I blame this. Not that, I mean, you still did it, though. Like, you're still in trouble. I don't know what the point in even, like, discussing that factor of it. Yeah. But it did make its way into court again, and it ended with someone's death. Yeah. And another time when it really feels like a convenient excuse was the murder of Amara Carson. She was 13 months old when she died. And so her mother, Jessica Bain Carson, met her boyfriend, Blaine Keith Millam, in the January of 2008. And by that spring, they were engaged. And by that summer, Carson turned 18 and Amora and Carson moved in with Milam. By the fall, Carson had stopped communicating with her family completely. And her best friend said that she seemed hollow, like when she looked at her. And Ooh. her parents said that she seemed to be like under the influence of Milam. But her best friend said that it seemed like Milam would do anything Carson told him to, which I thought was an interesting, like, interesting. to see that both sides. And her friend was like, 
he's the one who feeds Amora. He's the one that changes her diapers, like seem to love this baby. So alternatively, right. Carson said that Mullum would watch everything she did. He would even log on to like her social media accounts and talk to people as though he was her, which is just like a weird a de- detail to include. Creepy. So shortly after moving in together, they started using a Ouija board. Nothing good's going to come from this, it felt like, to me. So Carson and Millam had both lost their fathers, and they started using the board to talk to their dads. Okay. They alleged that the board told them that Carson's mother killed Carson's father, and that her father wouldn't be at peace unless Carson, quote, did something about it. Oh, no. Yeah, and I was like, that's some foreshadowing. That's not even the dark turn we take. So... Yeah. Carson started to believe that the apartment they lived in was filled with evil spirits. Oh, gosh. Because that's what happens when you use a Ouija board. Anywho. Carson said she began to notice that, like, Milan started not acting like himself. Like, the way he talked was strange and the tone of his voice and just, like, his mannerisms. So she thought that he was possessed by the devil. Okay. Of course. As one does. Okay. Obviously. Milan told Carson that he a demon had entered him and that when that happened, it gave him the ability to hear God. Oh. He also told Carson that the reason why a demon had entered him was because Carson had been lying to him and God knew. It was like a punishment. Oh. Very specific, a weird form of manipulation. Okay. Right? Yeah. So Carson stopped questioning Milan's actions when he was acting strangely because he told her that God says there's things you don't need to know right now. I literally would just be like, what do you mean? What do you mean? Like, if someone's like, has any piece of information, they're like, I just can't tell you right now. I'm like, well, literally, that's all I want to know now. Yeah, exactly. I can't even sleep. So on December 1st of 2008, Milam told Carson that Amora was possessed. And so she's a 13-month-old baby, right? So she's like not walking around, right? Because it's right. a little early for walking. I'm saying to Amanda because she knows babies and not me. Yeah. And... <laughs> <laughs> They walk around a year. Well, she was like walking around like confidently, like like an adult, if you think, like with that kind of poise. But so Milam tells Carson this and he tells her that Amora is possessed. Not okay. And that's where it starts to get really, really dark. He tells her that Amora was possessed because God was tired of Carson lying to Milam. Mm -hmm. And he also said that God had told him he would show Milam how to exercise the evil spirits from Amora. Oh, no. Carson didn't know anything about exorcisms, but she agreed. Okay, so just a bit of a trigger warning. A violent death of a baby is about to occur. So Milan tortures Amora for about 30 hours. When I was reading the case, I couldn't find exactly like the exact timeline of when some of these things happened. But during that time period, Carson and Milan went to Walmart and they brought Amora and put her in her car seat. Carson and Amora hung out in the car while Milan went in and did whatever you need to do. And then they went back home, continue the torture. At another point, Malam had a picture of Amora that he had taken after he had begun beating her. And her face was distorted. Aww. And he was like proving that that was possession, right? Like he's like, look, your baby's face is distorted. At another point, they start talking about whether Malam should sell his soul to the devil to free the baby of possession. But Carson tells him that she didn't want him to be trapped by the devil. At one point, they also go to a pawn shop because they want to go talk to a priest about exercising Amora by a priest instead of it being Malam. And Malam told Carson that God had told him that there was nothing a priest could do, at which point Carson says that she would rather her daughter go to heaven now than hell later. So she's like willing to take the risk with her baby, apparently. So then Malam resumes the exorcism. After they kill her, they put her in the bathroom floor of their trailer. And I was like, what? With that? And they were in the middle of renovating it. So that's why there was a hole. Okay. And the next morning they called the police and they, at first they feign ignorance. Like, we don't know what happened. We were meeting with someone. And when we came back, like she was dead, which I was like, why would you leave your baby anyway? So like the story already didn't make sense. Right. Right. And the people who they said they were meeting were immediately like, no, <laughs> yeah. I wasn't with them. So it, like their alibi just fell apart right away. So the evidence the police collected was bloodstained bedding and baby clothes, bloodstained diapers and wipes. There's some other evidence that I just, it's already gory enough. I don't think we need to get into that. And also I'm going to talk about her injuries, but I'm also going to leave some of these out because I think they're just, it's just too much. Mm -hmm. But she was beaten severely. Her skull, per the medical examiner, was, it looked like it was a jigsaw puzzle because there were so many fractures. Her brain was torn and damaged. It looked like one of her arms and one of her legs had been twisted in two. She also had 24 distinct bite marks covering her and so many scratches that they just kind of formed one injury. 
she was also strangled. They couldn't figure out which of these injuries are what actually caused her death. That's horrific. Because there was so many. And it was 30 hours of this. And Carson sat in this trailer and listened to this. There's no way. Yeah. And it's this is the worst crime I've ever heard of in my entire life. And it seems like for them, it started with that Ouija board. Like it start like them believing in the supernatural in this like deep and dark way seems to have come from that. And not the Ouija board's fault, obviously, but like No, that's just stupid. And I don't understand how Carson could just sit there. They're horrible people. Yeah. And they like they both appealed. Carson didn't torture her baby, but the fact that she stood there and listened to her scream during this prolong of a period. Yeah. Her and Millen were both convicted of capital murder. And ten out of ten, like they should have been. The most heinous thing I've ever heard. Like, I, I thought that I was going to find some crimes where people blame things on Ouija boards, but this was by far the worst thing I thought I could find. Yeah, it's abs- it, it is probably the worst thing I've, I've heard of. There's no way. There's no way that anyone should ever think that. And the fact that the mom just, like, sat back and let it happen, all of them are horrible. So it reminds me of that, that case, the Lori Vallow case, that is currently unfolding before our eyes in courts. And she, for those that don't know, just the gist of it, she believed her two kids, so her daughter and her son, were dark spirits and or zombies. And at one point, there's like a chart that her boyfriend, now a husband, said, you know, what level of darkness each person in like her life was. And there's phone conversations and things like that that people recall of where she calls her kids zombies. And they both were found in the the new husband in his yard. So they killed both the kids. And one of them was a special needs kid, which, again, kind of the same thing. Like, how can you harm something so innocent? Yeah. And it's currently in the court system now. They actually just last week joined their cases together. So they'll be tried together. And I am waiting for next year to see exactly what comes of this and how they try to get out of it. Yeah. So we asked some friends for personal accounts of them using Ouija boards or stories they've heard. And that's so we have we have a few of those that we're going to work through. Yeah, mine were a little more short uh, accounts, but other things have stemmed from some of them is the best way I can say it. But one of my friends, Nora, her three aunts were at her grandma's house in Mexico and they were playing with the Ouija board in the living room. Meanwhile, one of her aunt's babies was in one of the bedrooms. And as they asked the Ouija board a question the door to where the baby was sleeping slams and then the baby's crying. So of course, all three women jump up and they run towards the door and the door, even though it didn't have a lock, would not open. So one of the ants runs back into the living room and throws the board out the door thinking, you know, there has to be some correlation between what's going on, right? Yeah. She throws it out the door and almost immediately once it leaves the house, the door opens. I got chills when you said that. Yeah, the baby was fine. Later on, they ended up burning the board at the grandmother's house. And the family believes that after that, that's when the house started to get very weird and or haunted. So the family still owns the home, but no one will live there. Woof. There's also different strange accounts that she told me about, which I found fascinating. So my friend actually stayed the night at that house when her grandmother passed away, you know, for the funeral and all of that. And when she was staying the night, she got up in the middle of the night and was walking down the hallway and there was someone laying in the hallway. Her thinking one of her family members might have just been sleeping in the hallway. She stepped over the person, used the restroom, came out, person still there, stepped over the person, went back to bed. The next morning when she asked about that, no one had slept in the, the hallway. Huh. Well, I mean, also, like, why were you sleeping in that? Why would you assume somebody was sleeping in the hallway? I wouldn't assume that right away. I'd be like, she thought someone might have, like, had too much to drink and passed out. Or That's fair. <sighs> I don't like that either. Yeah, yeah. That makes me wildly uncomfortable. Yes. So there's also, she, she couldn't remember the, the big details to this, but there was a photo that was developed where one of the TV screens was off and... Everyone who's seen this photo believes that they're looking at the grandmother's reflection. However, the grandmother had passed away by the time this photo was taken. Ooh. And what makes it even scarier, and it gives me chills talking about it now, now that she's told me about it. In the picture, her grandmother's mouth 
was open, almost like she was screaming, and she was being held by what she could best describe as a gargoyle. What the hell? They have this photo still? That's what I asked immediately. I'm like, tell me you have this photo. Yeah. Well, from there, they printed this photo a number of times. Like everyone in the family had seen this photo. They took it to mediums, to psychics. And some had said, you know, the grandma's trying to warn them about something or she's not resting, many different things, right? They got everything blessed, everything, you know, they tried to do their best to to fix this. And after all of that, now no one can find their copy of this photo. Oh, that's an interesting wrinkle. Yeah. Ugh. But I also want to find that photo. Right. I know. She said that if she ever finds it, she will send it to me. Thank you. <laughs> But they they believe it might have been from burning the Ouija board. And and from when I was researching, that was like a big no-no that I found is you don't burn it. And there's been several different reasons why you don't burn it. Like the one I read was, oh, whoever hears it scream will die. But I've also heard that it like unleashes things too. So maybe that's it. I don't know. But that house, they still own it. Just no one will live there. I mean, fair. I also wouldn't want to live there. Absolutely. That is 10 out of 10. So the next story is my own. (laughs) So uh, at my 13th birthday party, I decided it would be a great idea during the slumber party portion if we had a seance, as most young teens do. Uh, We decided it would be, we didn't have a Ouija board. And uh, so we decided to make our own like the fools we were. And so we wrote out the alphabet. Yes, no, goodbye. Okay. And then brilliance of our teenage minds, we thought it would be more potent with blood. So it's actually one of my brother's friends. He pricked his leg in two different places with two different safety pins. I don't know why, but he did. And he just kind of like tossed him onto the floor afterwards. Again, not quite sure why. Weird thing to do. Weird thing to do. What I would do was not this, not this at all. I wouldn't do that. I, I did originally, my first lip piercing was with a safety pin though. Because oh. that's, that's what I would do with a safety Ow. pin. <laughs> so we were sitting on the floor and it was actually just it was like four gals sitting on the floor and we have a little circle lit our candles one by one okay. as you do and so we then we asked the board like questions and we asked not so much of course we're more looking for like proof of the spirits there because this house was the house that i grew up in and so it was pretty haunted like for sure at least in my opinion and i honestly i don't remember the little paper planchette that we made moving around too much but i remember all the things that happened around it so again not my most my brightest moment we asked the board if you're jack the ripper please make the candles flames flicker you and your jack the ripper my dad wrote comics on jack the ripper and dracula so like that was in the forefront of my creepy brain so the candles in the room start they basically start to like go out then burn bright then go out then burn bright like that's how much they're flickering and it's for about 10 seconds and everyone in the room sees it. We're highly unnerved. Then at another point, there was a balloon, because, you know, birthday party. And it was just like resting at the top of my ceiling. And we had really tall ceilings for whatever reason in this house, in this particular room. And maybe they just seem tall because I'm 5'2". But <laughs> at one point, there's this red balloon telling that drops like three feet and starts moving sh- in a straight line throughout the room. And it come, it's coming to the middle of the circle. So whatever we were doing, we just kind of stop. So yeah. I get up, I take the balloon, and I put it in another room. When I come back, like, everybody who was sitting there, like, it was dark-ish in there. But, like, our shadows were on the wall in ways which made sense. But when I came back in the room, one of the girl's shadows was a shotgun. Like, it was the shadow of a shotgun. Weird. Like, the shape? Yeah. And, like, no clue why. Okay. Bad vibes. I n- I've never touched one since. Because I just... That none of that was good. Like none of that was good things that I wanted to see or hear or do. And I think that if you see ghosts or have like I don't know any type of spiritualism esque to you, then you have to be extra careful with Ouija boards and stuff like that. And if you don't know what you're doing, you could probably get some real dark stuff. So another experience I have is my friend Amy. She for her tenth birthday it was spooky themed. So she and her friends played with a store-bought Ouija board. Uh Uh-huh. And she had admittedly been moving the planchette to mess with her friends. Of course. (laughs) And she remembers when they were done. She packed it up. She put everything in the box. And then she carries the box to their spare room and puts it away. And when she wakes up the next morning, the board is out, set up on the table again. And she asked her parents then, and they said it was no. And she asked her parents this morning some, I don't know, 
20 plus years later again just to make sure like like are they still going to hold on if it was them and they're like no that wasn't us that's creepy yeah and so my friend amy also she told me about a story from her friend Corey. Corey's mother was a member of a prominent cult and she grew up in it and her mother recounted this story so they were playing with a ouija board and it started counting down so zero nine eight seven and one of the kids moves the planchette to the side and asks what the countdown is the planchette spells out death. So the kids break the board in half and throw it away. The next morning, the board is sitting on the kitchen table, set up where it had been the night before. Ugh. Ooh. There's a lot of different accounts like that. So, yeah. I changed names, by the way. Just as a general note, with the exception of the story that I told where I said it was me, I've changed names for everybody. The next stories that I have are about people who were very into it. Okay. So Jane used the Ouija board pretty regularly and she would meet with one of her friends like every other week or so to just play with it casually. Okay. And one night they're playing around with it and the board said, Jane, Jane, this is your aunt. Very strange. Okay. And Jane's confused because her aunt was alive and she said something to that. Like she was like, my aunt is alive. She's talking to the board saying this. And the board says, no, no, I died. I was killed. Ooh. And Jane's again, like, surprised, a little shook, very disbelieving. It's like, my aunt is alive. So over the next hour, the board tells Jane and Tim the story about Jane's aunt's death, per the board. The board said that Jane's uncle killed her aunt and that Jane needed to call the police so that someone could arrest her uncle. Okay. Jane was unconvinced because she's played with a Ouija board a ton. She's like, sometimes there's tricks, sometimes there's lies. So she asked the board something only her aunt would know and says, what was the story you took to me? You took me to when I was a kid. And what was I so excited to buy? And the board's like, hot topic, a hat, <laughs> like real, just straightforward, which was correct. And like that kind of goes with what we were talking about earlier, right? Like maybe like she knew that, right? So like maybe it could answer that. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And like, OK, OK. And so the board keeps trying to convince Jane to call her aunt's house. I feel like that's what I would have done immediately, though. Well, but it was like midnight by the time the story's out. Oh, I don't care. And like her aunt's a very serious gal. Oh, OK. And her uncle goes to sleep early. So she's like, <laughs> like I don't want to just like disrupt people out of nowhere. This would be strange. And like her family's close. So they all talk. So like she knew it was going to get back to her mom. Yeah. The board then says, your uncle killed me because he found out I was cheating and he couldn't handle it. Oh, OK. It was then that she started getting like a gut feeling that something was wrong and she started to get really concerned. So she decides to call her aunt and uncle's house and she figures she'll tell them that she had a bad dream and that's why she's calling because like she had a bad dream. It struck her. She just wanted to make sure her aunt was okay. I think that's fair. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And so her uncle aunt is like typically the type who falls asleep like, on the couch at like 730 because he works so hard. He works long hours. And so when she calls at midnight, no one answers. She calls again and her uncle answers and he seems to be awake, which is really strange. So this makes Jane like immediately on edge because she didn't expect anybody to answer the phone. Yeah. Yeah. And if they did, she didn't expect it to be him. So Jane mentions that she had a bad dream and wants to speak to her aunt. And her uncle tells her like, no, she's sleeping. She'll call you back tomorrow. And like Jane tries to be like a little insistent. And then he starts to get a little odd. Right. So he starts dodging the questions and changing the subject. Jane's getting more nervous at this point. Ugh, I don't like this. I don't like it. OK, I know. I know. So at one point, her uncle says, like, are you still living here? And it was a city that she had moved out of three years ago. Okay. And he knew this like it was like common knowledge. So it was really strange yeah. that he was misremembering that what that way. The rest of the night felt off. Jane couldn't sleep. And so the board continues to tell the story about her aunt's murder and gives more details about the affair. Okay. She says that her aunt had reconnected with a guy she knew in high school on a website named classmates.com. The board said that she was having an affair with someone named Peter, gave the years her aunt was in high school, and originally knew Peter, and reiterated that the pair was having an affair. Jane said the way that the board talked even felt like her aunt. So she's like believing more and more. At this point, Jane says, is there anything I can do to stop this? And the board, as her aunt says, no, I'm already dead. And even if you warn me, I'm stubborn. I wouldn't believe you. Well, yeah. So 30 minutes or so go by since she's spoken with her uncle on the phone. And her cousin, her aunt and uncle's son, calls and says, like, oh, hey, I heard you were asking about my mom. Like, and Jane's like, yeah, I had just a really bad dream and I just wanted to check on her. And he's like, oh, no, it's fine. Like, I saw her a little while ago with the dogs. It's fine. And she's like, oh, 
could I talk to her then? And he's like, oh, no, she like went right back to sleep. Yeah. And they chat for a bit. And Jane's like trying to get off the phone because she's still like uneasy and like not wanting to have like chit chat. And so she's like, well, I'm really glad you saw your mom. And she was fine because I was really worried. And he says, like, you know what? Actually, I didn't see her. Just I heard the dogs moving around. So I assumed it was her. I'm assuming that because normally his father probably goes to bed earlier. So he assumed that if somebody was up with the dogs, it was her. Right. So then Jane's like, okay, but can you wake her up then? (laughs) Because she's getting worried again. And so he's like, I'm not waking her up because she's certainly going to yell at me if I wake her up, which is now right. It's probably closer to one in the morning. And so he gives her his mother's cell phone and then Jane tries to call her. He also said, like, oh, she always answers. Her phone's always on. So, like, even if it was, like, next to her, like, she would wake up and answer it. Yeah. Jane calls. It goes straight to voicemail. The sinking feeling again. So, at this point, Jane's 100% sure that something's happened to her aunt. And she's, like, grieving this loss. The next morning, Jane's aunt calls her okay. and is safe and sound. I was going to say, like, this, this seems like a better ending than I thought. Okay. Okay, right. So, but follow me because it gets a little stranger. So Jane is super relieved. She's like, oh, okay, great. And so as she knew, she gets a call from her mom. And her mom's like, so I heard that you called your aunt and uncle late last night. And Jane's like, I don't want to tell her that it was a Ouija board. So she's like, yeah, I had a really bad dream. And she tells her everything in the context that it was a dream. And her mom, grew up, like she, she was describing it. She was like, my mom was like, <gasps> like she dramatically gasps. Yeah. And that doesn't make Jane feel any better because she's kind of already on edge about this, right? Like she didn't sleep the night before. She's worried about her aunt. It's up. It's down. And so (laughs) her mom's like, that made me nervous. And Jane's like, well, why does that make you nervous? And she's like, well, you know how jealous your uncle gets. And (laughs) and Jane's like, that seems like like when she was describing it to me, she's like, that seemed like a weird reaction. Yeah. So Jane lived a few hours away from her parents and she was planning on visiting them that weekend. And her grandmother also lived with her parents at that point, and her aunt would come over and do her grandmother's hair. So I believe her mom kind of, like, worked it out so that Jane and her aunt were at the same place at the same time. Okay. So Jane could talk to her aunt. When Jane gets there, Jane's mom's like, okay, didn't tell you this before, but your aunt has been having an affair. And, like, from everything I've heard, it's with her high school flame. No. And there's no way Jane would have known about that, right? She lived hours away, and she wasn't, like, into her aunt's love life in that way. Right? Like, how would she have known that? So Jane's mom tells Jane to tell their other aunt and her grandmother. And when she speaks to her grandmother and her her other aunt, they both confirm, like, all the details. They're like, yup, that's right. That's how she met him. That's his name. That's when she went to high school. Like, Jane's floored. (laughs) Right? So she's like, she, again, like, used the Ouija board a ton. So wasn't surprised to get accurate information. Right. But she was certainly surprised about this accurate information. So then Jane talks to her aunt. And it's like, this is what, this is what the boy, like, this is what my dream was. And her aunt, deadass, looks her in the eyes and lies and says, I'm not having an affair. None of that is true. Okay, good. (laughs) I was going to say. Eek, she's still alive, though. She's still alive. So that's good. But so, like, I had so many follow-up questions for Jane. I was like, oh, like, what if? Yeah. Do you have another relative who passed who maybe, like, could see what was going on and could see what was going to happen? And she was like, no, (laughs) but she, the way that Jane described it, like from her experiences with Ouija boards, she doesn't necessarily think that like time's the same on that way. So she's like, maybe it was my aunt in, in the future dead. Because think about what her aunt said, like, even if you told me I was stubborn, I wouldn't believe you. And even when she told her aunt, she was stubborn. She didn't believe her. (laughs) Yeah, that's a chilling story. But is her aunt like safe now? Like. Yeah, she's fine. Like she's fine. And so, okay, okay, she's fine-ish. Because here's here's two more things. So one of the reasons that Jane's mom was so nervous was because her uncle had killed a man before. Okay. He like he was hanging out with like some of his family and somebody said something he didn't like and he killed him. Oh, okay. He was younger though. He didn't get as severe of a sentence because he was younger. Okay. I don't know all the details on that, but I was like, oh, goodness. So also within the past few years, her aunt goes into the garage at 3 a.m. or so. Again, as one does. And when she does, she opens the door and there's an explosion. Their car blows up. There's like the back of her aunt's hair is singed. I think one of the dog's hair is singed. The entire house burned down and they don't know why. That's scary. Right? This is a good 
example to me of things she would not have known. Right. And it's her friend Tim certainly didn't know anything about her like family and affairs and stuff like that. So where was that coming from? That freaked me out. So, okay. I also have a couple of stories about two friends named Michaela and Erica. They were both living in Florida with a woman named Colleen. And Colleen had a son named Hank at the time. And he was like four. And they were, and Michaela and Erica were playing with the Ouija board because they did that pretty often. And the board says that the person speaking to them is Colleen's dad. And they're like, oh, that's weird. That's crazy. And so, and the board said, I talk to Hank all the time. I see him often, which I think is kind of sweet that like her father's talking to him. And they're, the, the phrasing that one of them used was, whoa, that's nuts. Uh, and they're, <laughs> they're like, is there anything that we can tell Colleen that only the two of you would know? And the board spells out a pet name that the two of them used. And Colleen confirms it. And so Colleen then confirms that her son Hank had told her in the past that he sees his grandfather and dreams about him. And that's what made Erica a believer in Ouija boards. She was kind of skeptical before that. And I was like, that's interesting. And so Michaela was another person who I talked to who had like a vast amount of information on Ouija boards. And one of the things she said to me was like, the number one rule when I use a Ouija board with somebody is if they have a hesitation or a gut feeling to not touch the board, oh. they cannot touch the board because nothing good is going to come from that. And she's had like several experiences where someone kind of sucked it up or pushed their feelings down and good things did not happen after. But so Michaela and Erica, they met a friend as they described him through the Ouija board and his name was Ethan. And they met him in the early 2000s. He said that he had died in 1999. Okay. And they both described him as, quote, a protector and a friend. They had talked about that they had talked to him for years. So another interesting part about the friendship that they had with Ethan was from the beginning, he told them that he was eventually going to move on and that he was going to be reincarnated. So that, like, oh, if he just disappeared one day, that was why. And so... They talked to him for years, and then one day he just disappeared. And so they wondered if he's on Earth again. If he's on Earth again. So one time they were at a casino, and they do not have their Ouija board with them. They didn't bring it to the casino? No, they didn't, which they were really into it. So I wouldn't have surprised me if they did. But so they're like kind of losing, and they're like, come on, Ethan, we like need a new couch. We need a whole bunch of stuff. Please, please help us win. And they say like, oh my god, if we win... We'll get your name tattooed on us. Guess what happened? They won. And now Ethan's name's tattooed on them in a Ouija board. I love that. They're beautiful tattoos. But so they tattooed the name of their Ouija friend on their bodies. <laughs> he never gave his phone number. He didn't give his phone number. So, but like, this isn't the first instance of them talking to him. Like, they've been talking to him for years. At one point, they move across the country and they ask Ethan if he wants to come. And he says, yes. So he does. Like, they talk to him all the time. Like, they really consider him a friend. And at one point, they were playing, and it was really strange. So Erica was describing this to me, and she said, they were playing with a Ouija board, they were talking to Ethan, and he said, go, pain, go right now. Pain? Pain, yeah. And they're like, what? No one's in pain. And he's like, go, pain, yeah. right now. And just keep saying it. Over. He's, like, really insistent. And they're like, go, go where? Like, what are you talking about? Because they're confused. None of that, all of them are fine. And they're playing with another friend, and, like, he was fine, so they're really confused. And then the board, as Ethan said, hospital. So like that's strange. They take a break and Erica goes into the bathroom. And when she does, she almost falls over because she has this excruciating pain in her abdomen. Oh, my gosh. Like appendix or? So they go to the hospital because, I mean, what are the odds, right? Like, what are the odds? And when she goes, she finds out that she had an ovarian cyst that twisted. Oh, wow. And there wasn't anything they could have done in the hospital, right? Yeah. But she was like, it was just interesting that like he predicted that pain before him and so the last little example that they had given i see little but it's i don't think this is a little example but another example of him being kind of a protector was so they went to a casino again and they're losing again so they're like okay we're gonna leave and like they're like talking to each other about leaving so like their intentions are clear and then the entire casino blacks out for like a few minutes they just said they said it was like somewhere between like five and ten minutes which is really strange because casinos have generators and stuff because there's too much going on for it to be a blackout. Yeah. And they were like, well, if we didn't see a sign before, we're heading out because that blackout's weird. And the road to the casino was like curving and swerving and winding. And so they're driving down the road to leave. 
and there's a massive crash on the road in front of them. Tons of cars, tons of people hurt. Like it's a truly horrific accident. And they're like, wow, that's kind of strange. And like, it's very clear that if they had been there five minutes earlier, they would have been a part of that accident. Oh, that's scary. So they get on the Ouija board that night and they talk to Ethan. And he says that if they would have left when they did, they would have been in that accident. Eek. So he messed with the lights to make sure they didn't get into that accident. Do you have chills? I have chills. Uh, yeah, yeah. This is like the second time I've heard that, me saying it now. And I have chills saying that. How do you explain that? Yeah. Is that not unbelievable? Like, not unbelievable, but like, woof. Like, what a... How do you explain that? Crazy. Oh, everyone needs an Ethan. Yeah. Like, woof. But those are stories that, like, I, it's hard for me... To just chalk those up to the scientific explanations that we have for Ouija boards. Yeah. So one of the stories I got from a friend is it was, it's not her story, but it's her grandmother's story. And her and some of her girlfriends were staying in a cabin in the woods in California and they played with the Ouija board and they got a little freaked out. So they went and they threw it in the garbage and the grandmother unfortunately has passed. So she can't ask for exact details, but she wants to say that they had tried or attempted to burn it, right? So I would think scorch marks on it. They throw it in the garbage, they go to bed. They woke up and they found it fully intact on the dining room table the next morning, which is super similar to the first couple stories you told where it just like appears back in one piece. Yeah. Where you didn't leave it. So that's that's one that I don't think I can explain that seems to be like a recurring thing that happens in Ouija board stories, like even ones that I've read online. But I feel like that's something that's like recurring, that somebody tries to get rid of a board and the board doesn't let them. And the board's like, nope, I'm coming back. I'm coming back. Just the one side of me always wants to go, well, who was pranking all of these people? Like, was it a friend or was it some outside source that's like, oh, I saw a Ouija board in the trash can. Like, can I Yeah, freak these people out? I, uh, maybe my mind just wants to go to that. But the Ethan story, too, for sure, I can't explain. I don't know how any of that could be done or if it's just like a really, really happy coincidence. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. So there is a How to Get Rid of a, a Ouija Curse by Iloki from Reddit. And this was posted like five years ago. So it's kind of old, but still, still great. I'm just going to read the post. This happened to my friend once. What we found to be the best idea to confuse the demon spirit. First, you want to hang all your pictures upside down on your walls. This may require you take them out of the frame and turn them over and put them back in. Then you need to stack your books from smallest on the bottom to largest on the top. Whatever bottles and jars around the home should be stacked in the same way, smallest to largest. <laughs> set, your, set your oven on the lowest temperature, which is likely between 150 and 170, and place your shoes and purse in it. Do not worry. They will not burn if there is a demon present as she or he will take the heat from the oven in confusion. <laughs> Finally, you want to stand in the spot where your Ouija board was and each player must take turns slapping one another. <laughs> it is important that you're on the exact same spot, though. Let me know if you have any questions. <laughs> Well, first off, all of their jars are going to be broken. There's going to be glass <laughs> everywhere. Their oven's going to be on fire from their purse. Being in it. And then they're going to be sitting in the living room slapping each other. <laughs> it's the last part that really gets me. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously, like inhaling fumes from the, their burning shoes and purse as well. What a wild time. So with all that said, do you think Ouija boards? Legit? Not legit? Somewhere in the middle? I think I'm still where I was at the beginning of this, where I feel like some of them are things that I can't explain. And yeah, there, there's going to be things that can happen and spirits can, you know, manipulate in certain fashions that are unexplainable. But also, I think sometimes we know more than we let on or that we know that we know. And we're able to uh, understand more than we have explanations for. I think our brain is a powerful machine and there's things that we don't understand about it and the Ouija board helps emphasize some of those things yeah I agree I think that right. Ouija boards can work especially with like some of the experience that I've had that my friends have had like I've just 
it's kind of like with ghosts, in my opinion, mm-hmm. and we've talked about this before, that like, I don't believe that every experience where someone says they've seen a ghost was an actual ghost. And likewise, I don't believe that every time somebody used a Ouija board and had something happen, yeah. that it was a ghost or a demon or whatever. But I do think that sometimes we're talking to something else because I just, I can't explain away, you know, even just my experience, like candles flipping on and off someone's shadow changing into an inanimate object. Those are things that just don't make sense that I can't wrap my head around. So some things are just unexplainable, in my opinion. Agreed. And we'd love to hear from everyone else. If uh, you want to share some creepy Ouija stories with us, we'd love to share them with others. So please tag us or put it on our social media. And we'll see you next Friday. Thanks for listening. For more information on our sources, please visit our website, truecreeps.com. If you'd like to follow us on social media, you can follow us on Instagram at True Creeps Pod, on Facebook at facebook.com slash truecreepspod, and on Twitter at True Creeps. We'd love for you to keep creeping with us. So if you like this episode, please subscribe, rate, review, and share the show with your fellow creeps. 